emergency, we have exits, um, both exit doors through there, there and also at the back where we came. Hopefully people are familiar with the toilets and um, they're back through the foyer there. So got most of the housekeeping over and done with. Uh, we still are in a pandemic. So what we need to do is just make sure that we're keeping everybody safe. The room is well ventilated. If people prefer to wear face coverings when they're moving around, please do so. Um, it's important that everybody feels really comfortable this evening. What we are going to do is have a one-way system up onto the stage. So when we do announce the awards later on this evening, um, please come up and proceed to the left-hand side of the stage. Come on this way. You'll get the award. Pause for a picture and then back off the stage via the left. Um, I always get the door bits to do. So um, the door bits are done and dusted this evening. What I do want to say is we've had a record number of entries again this year. Some absolutely phenomenal achievements. And it makes me so proud to be part of the council, having seen some of the incredible achievements that each one of you have undertaken throughout the year. So I am going to commence the Service Excellence Awards and I'm going to hand over and introduce Kirsten England, our Chief Executive. Thank you. tell you what I'm only drinking municipal um, <laughs> pop this evening so there we go well look team Bradford you're looking amazing um, I've been saying to people before I'd forgotten how to dress up for an occasion but you certainly haven't and it's it, wonderful to be here last year we were only able to do these awards virtually and we did our best didn't we and we had a good time from our sitting rooms and kitchens and wherever we happened to be but to be here together and celebrating, there's such a buzz around the room just with people seeing each other, a lot of people going, I've only seen you like that for about 20 months. Oh, that's what you look like in real life. It is wonderful to be here. Um, but as Anne has said, COVID is still with us. Infection rates are still high. And I actually also think we should take a moment to remember, though this evening will be celebratory, from start to finish of the awards, and rightly so, I want us to take a moment just to remember the fact that over this last 20 months, we have lost colleagues, we've lost friends, we've lost loved ones. Many people have been poorly and are still living with long COVID. So I do think it would be right and proper to just, if you can, stand for a moment in memory of the people that we have lost over the last 20 months. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you for doing that. So we're here to celebrate. We're here to celebrate you. Everybody nominated tonight is a winner in my eyes. In fact, the whole workforce of the council are stars. We're here to celebrate the incredible work you do day in, day out, week in, week out, you know, year round, the way in which you serve the people of this district and create the conditions for people to have great lives here. When I was thinking about this evening and what I wanted to say, three words kept coming into my mind. Pride, and I think Anne's already used that word, proud, pride, privilege, and passion. I have intense pride in the work that we've delivered over this last period. I feel really privileged to be your chief executive, to lead Team Bradford, and to work alongside you in this room and the 10,000 others who work for this council. And passion, because one of the things, and I've worked in a number of authorities and different organisations, the thing that marks us out is the passion we have for this place and the determination to do the right thing and create a better future for the people that live here. I was reflecting back over the last 20 months and just that kind of, the pride I have when I think about the speed at which we turned ourselves inside out, 
the determination and the common cause we made to do what it took to protect the people of this district, to support them through the most extraordinary of times, and to sustain the critical services and build the conditions for recovery. People showed incredible willingness to stay on the front line, particularly in supporting vulnerable people and keeping critical services going. People you know, got into their kitchens, worked out the internet, um, and got the kit together, and, and put up with a lot of the you know, hurdles and bumps in the road. IT worked their absolute socks off. Um, people were redeployed at a moment's notice into new roles, working with new colleagues. Refuse crews became sometimes the people that those who were self-isolating and shielding, but not on our radar, the people they saw in a week, and became friends to those isolated and sometimes vulnerable individuals. Uh, I remember the story about the refuse crew that made a little boy's birthday absolutely spectacular, which got quite a lot of media interest and just is a hallmark of the degree of care. I remember the story about the carers and the social workers keeping an eye on those individuals that they knew would be particularly vulnerable, and the social workers who left their families and went to live with a terminally ill child so that that child could be surrounded by love in their final hours and days and receive the right care. I remember meeting colleagues from our outdoor centres, housing, leisure, corporate services who helped open and run the food hub that we ran before the um, central deliveries from government really got going. The way that we got food to the food banks when they were running out. The people doing the business grants, the hardship funds, repurposing the money for the cultural sector to keep those one-man bands and organisations going. The people who were thinking about new ways to keep people active even though they were cooped up in their houses and only could have 30 minutes exercise. Um, the COVID youth ambassadors, what an amazing innovation that was, bringing so many young people. And one of the things we've done now is just through Kickstart and make a huge commitment to Kickstart, bring so many more talented young people into the organization, breathing new life and bringing new insights and perspectives. The people working in emergency management, and actually I've talked to them this evening, and yes, they brought the LFTs and the masks down just in case we need them. Um, apparently they've already solved one crisis because the IT was going to down, going to go down, so they brought a dongle. So, I mean, our, our emergency management team, there is nothing they haven't managed in the last 20 months. Fire, flood, infection, the unexpected, they've done it all. Incredible work by everybody. And those people who also, in the background, kept assessing, analysing and advising us about where we needed to focus and what we needed to be doing next. Tracking those terrible differential impacts on our poorest communities, our black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities. Holding the mirror up and telling us where we needed to be focused and make sure we were doing the right thing. And then those who kept focused on long term and recovery. And we, you know, tonight we have probably the most ambitious programme of growth for this district that this place has seen for 40 years and, and critical announcements to come um, around the corner really on, on whether we will secure sufficient money to realise all of our ambition. But I'm really proud that we kept our eye on the long game as well as the immediate. And in the midst of all that, some people have been really poorly, some people have been bereaved and, and particularly I know quite a few colleagues who've lost parents through this period. People have been anxious and juggling childcare, working from home. Oh, and in the midst of it all, um, this May we ran, I think, the most complex set of elections this country has ever seen. Um, and that was a whole team game across every service of the council where all the hierarchies, the labels came off. And um, I've never seen so much Perspex screening in my life. Um, um, and, I'm, and we are going to reuse it for the, the uh, eco-warriors in the audience. Absolutely, we're going to use it. But that's just a smattering, really, of what you, we, have done over the last, um, the last nearly two years, actually, to be honest. I think Sarah, who I can just see, will say with the first words COVID-19 was spoken at the back end of 2019, weren't they? So that's my pride, my real pride in what we've done. And the privilege, it's such a privilege to be your chief exec, to see your resilience, you know, you keep going. You keep going because you care. To see your tenacity, no, I'm going to sort this out, I'm going to work it out, I'm going to think about the different ways we could do this. And that commitment, going be above and beyond. Um, standing in the rain, you know, the outdoor leisure centre staff who were used to taking kids up mountain standing in the rain queue busting when the refuse uh, the household waste sites reopened you know just just getting on and doing it even if it wasn't generally your your day job 
I've met and visited some of you, and I've not met and visited all of you. And you know, I'm, that will be an unending ambition of mine to, to get to know everybody. But one of the things we have learned in the last year is the power of virtual, um, I've, and we must keep on with that. I've never been able to address a thousand colleagues before, and also see the willingness to solve problems together, to share ideas and suggestions with colleagues, to make sure that we were all on the same page. And um, that's been a real plus in building and keeping that esprit de corps for Team Bradford going. And now, now we live in an uncertain moment with COVID still running amok, I'm afraid, and, and the winter around the corner. Um, and at slightly uncertain times, as, we, as probably we all know in terms of budgets, we know that budgets will be tight. We know we see the challenging circumstances for many families in this, dif uh, in this district now and the demand that is coming through our doors in terms of the, the difficult places people find themselves in. We need to, in the midst of all that, recognise that we are also quite tired. We've been working so hard for so long and, and we need to look after each other. We need to find more ways than just this evening to make it habitual and daily that we appreciate one another you know, all of who we are, all of who we br what we bring to work, and the difficult circumstances we sometimes in our personal lives are juggling with. We need to strengthen that support we give to all of you. I hope you are aware of all the support that there is available through um, HR and, and on wellbeing um, that we've been kind of delivering over the last few months. But we also need to make sure we keep on with this conversation and discussion about who we are as an organisation, what we want to achieve and how we're going to achieve it together and involving you in shaping all that. And to do that, we need to tap into that passion we share for this place. Um, you know, we want a recovery that benefits everybody and it isn't at the expense of our future. We know this um, pandemic has impacted people differently and we need to make sure that the future is not like that. Whoever you are, wherever you're born, wherever you live, whatever circuit, we want you to have a decent shot, a great childhood, a good education, a job which doesn't leave you on the poverty line and living into old age and good health. Simple, isn't it? That's what we're here to do, really. And your passion will get us there. And in the short term, of course, we've got some big things going on, some of which you'll see on the screen. City of Culture 2025. Um, as I've said, we've got through the qualifying rounds. It's like being the England or maybe the Scotland football team. Um, no, maybe the England football team because it gets further, doesn't it? Let me be honest. Um, we've got through the qualifying rounds. We're into the next, we're into the groups. We're, you know what, we're into the knockout competition now. We've really got to roll our sleeves up. There's something for everybody to do in City of Culture and something exciting for everybody to get out of it. We're also waiting for big decisions around whether we get a high-speed railway station on a through line for Bradford on the kind of Manchester Leeds line. We hope we'll get a down payment on that next week. That might sound like just a bit of, about railways and trains. It's actually transformational for the growth of our whole place. It will unlock huge amounts of growth and build the confidence of investors to come here and grow their businesses. So those two things are really, really crucially important right now. And alongside that, of course, is ensuring, as I've said, we give kids great childhoods. And we know that's a challenge. I know great social workers work for us. It's my job to make sure that they can deliver the kind of services that we would expect for all our children. And in the next year, the other thing that is crucial is that we continue to be, as we have been through the pandemic, through the amazing work of the COVID hub, stronger communities, youth service, all of our service, in fact, alongside our communities, not doing things to and for them, but being with and alongside them, really building the conditions for vibrant community life. So now then, I think that's enough from me right now. You'll see enough of me this evening. Um, but I want to introduce to you um, one of the very important citizens of our district this year. I'm absolutely delighted to say that uh, Councillor Bev Mullaney, who's the Deputy Lord Mayor, um, you know, you, look, I, my shoe fell off, so don't be nervous, Bev. This is going to go well, right? You can't, you know, you can't top that. Um, so welcome to the stage, and I'm sure colleagues would love to hear from you. Thank you, Kirsten, for that and that wonderful speech. I'd like to say good evening, everybody. And for those of you that don't know me, I'm sure a lot of you will. 
I am Councillor Beverly Mullaney, the Deputy Lord Mayor of Bradford. And I would also like to warmly welcome you all to the 2021 Excellence Awards. This is a night of celebration for the staff who work at Bradford Council, and this year's finalists have come from across the organisation where they have shown excellence in the delivery of frontline services to the citizens of our district. These prestigious awards are a benchmark for best practice standards within our authority. It's absolutely fantastic to see all those who work so tirelessly to ensure that our services are maintained and delivered to an exceptional standard. Being recognised in this very special way in a year that has been an extremely challenging year. <clears throat> COVID presented, prevented us from meeting last year. So it is particularly pleasing to see everyone here in person this evening. We rightly recognise the dedicated work teams and individuals undertaking carrying out their roles. But this evening's finalists have gone above and beyond even that. Staff members across our authority have repeatedly gone that extra mile and have showcased both their commitment to their roles and to the people we serve. This striving for excellence in often difficult circumstances is appreciated hugely by colleagues and more widely the people of Bradford for our services. So this year I feel very privileged to be here to tell you what this year's categories are. We've got the Employer of the Year, Leader of the Year, Apprentice of the Year, Team of the Year, Sustainability Stars, Collaboration and Partnership, Innovation, Building Diversity and Inclusion, Children at the Heart of All We Do. I would like to extend my congratulations to all of the finalists who have been nominated for an award this evening. Just reaching this final shortlist is absolutely superb in itself, and one of which you can all be extremely proud. So on behalf of the authority and the people of our district, thank you so, so much for everything that you do. Thank you. But while I'm up here, <clears throat> could I please expand on the challenges this year within Bradford context? Examples, Lord Mayor's office working to support the people of Bradford. IT support have supported me all year round. Frontline key workers, lots, Kirst has already mentioned, refuse, waste collection, the registrars, facilities, management, building attendance, all those who've been redeployed providing invaluable resources and efforts where needed. So, all have a drink and have a fabulous evening. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Deputy Lord Mayor, sorry. <laughs> Councillor Millian, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, so, it's uh, now my honour to introduce our special guest for the evening, and she is a very special guest. Um, the first black woman to win Olympic gold for Great Britain. She's won multiple medals and awards and has been awarded MBE, OBE, CBE from Her Majesty the Queen. Um, I um, had the pleasure of meeting Tessa before the event started, and... Uh, it's great uh, meeting her, and uh, I, I realised I did watch her. I needed just to check competing at the Commonwealth Games in Edinburgh when I was a teenager and, and was inspired um, by her. I have watched her career throughout, but I couldn't remember, if it, but my dad took me to watch, and it was a very exciting um, day. I also saw Jeff Capes, if anyone remembers that. He was still competing at that time. Um, so really exciting to have Tessa with us. Um, and uh, before we welcome her to the stage, let's just have a little look back at her career and life. So if we can turn our attention to the screen.
Wow, an extraordinary set of achievements. Um, and I think you'll probably agree she displays all of that grit, determination, tenacity, and ability to kind of challenge the norm and succeed that we know we need as part of our kind of essentials in Team Bradford. So without further ado, can we give a huge, warm Bradford welcome to Tessa Sanderson. <laughs> for that very warm welcome. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. I am delighted to be here this evening and to share in your awards. I've heard so many wonderful things that has gone on, and I'm really looking forward to the presentations and all that, and hearing a lot more chats about what has been happening and so on. But, however, it is a pleasure to be here, and I love awards nights anyway. But you know what, sometimes when I hear or oh, people say you've got the MBE, OB, CB and all these wonderful achievements and I sit there and I think, oh my God, did I really do all of that? But I'm only 30. <laughs> oh, well, thank you kindly. You should know. Uh, there I was thinking, oh, I'm coming to a really nice crowd and they'll think that I'm so young and everything like that. But you know what? But that's okay. That's okay. Um, Life for me, how has it been in sport? It's been ups and downs, you know, there's been challenges and all that, but it's all been fun. But how did it start for me? Well, at the age of 13, I threw a cricket ball 199 feet. Wow. As, well, I thought you guys might have been jealous. <laughs> Almost 60 metres. So, you know, and then my, my teacher discovered me. And now we've still been friends. I mean, her jaw dropped when I threw that ball, and she said, oh, you know what, son, you've got a bit of talent. So I thought, OK, that's a bit positive. And then she introduced me to my athletics club and also to my coach, Wolf Place, who uh, was my coach for 20-odd years. And he lived in Leeds as well. I used to come up to uh, um, Bradford quite a lot because his daughter lives in Shipley. Yeah, I had to run to get the train like crazy to get there today, but I'm here. So we used to come up quite a lot, um, you know, just to visit Joan backwards and forwards. So I'm quite familiar with sort of like the area and also Leeds itself. But after I threw that cricket ball and my teacher thought, well, you know, you've got some talent. She introduced me to my coach, Will Pace, as I say, but... And my career span in competition for 26 years. And that throw there was 37 years old. And I can see it's still a record. And I'm the only female, as I said, female, male or female, to have kept that record for that time. Hey, I tell you what. Thank you. But please don't get thinking my age, because you'll get it wrong. I promise you. Well, I hope so anyway. <laughs> but um, the thing is, yes, yeah, so the record is still there. But there have been moments in track and fields that's been great for me. It started, as I say, you know, through that ball and then, but my first major sort of thing came in 1974 at the Commonwealth Games. And we're all qualif trying to qualify to get that Commonwealth Games. And there was a girl called Sharon Avan, Sharon Corbett, myself, and various others trying to get to New Zealand. Because, you know, at that time, you're thinking, oh, my God. You know, from the moment I came, my parents would, couldn't pay for me to travel anywhere, to train, all this blah, 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 to actually be going to New Zealand. This is going to be fantastic. So we got to the trials at Crystal Palace, and there was Sharon, tall, leggy girl, looking really beautiful. And she came up, and she sort of warmed up everything. We got to the competitions now. She came up, did her throw, lined up the javelin, threw out there, oh, just made a small amount of noise, and the javelin sailed out. And she kept on doing this for a couple of rounds. So I thought, this is madness. And she was really whooping all of us. So on the fourth round, in came Tessa, picked up my javelin. I thought, this is madness, you know. Came in, picked it up, ran up, put it in the same position, and gave a massive roar. Ah! And it sailed out. And guys, guess what? Yeah, I was on my way to New Zealand. And to be honest, I didn't really care who was behind me. So that's how my journey started. And then in 1978, oh, we started to see the fear. Fatima Whitbread. Mm. 
Do we know her? <laughs> of course you do. She's my best mate. Uh, yeah, for sure. However, it's great. It's great when you've got rivals. In everything you do, there is rivals. In competition, it's great for you. You know, resilience as well, determination. It's all about sort of captivating that, getting all of that together, dust yourself off and come back and make sure that things happen the right way. And that's how it was for me and Fatima. And in the end, I wanted to beat her. She wanted to beat me. I wanted to beat her in everything possible. Take no prisoners. That's what I say. So, you know, in 78, went to the Commonwealth Games. I won that one, which was lovely. Another battle won. But through those times, I had to really get to know my rival, had to really set my goals, know my coach, know the team that I had around me, fear absolutely no one. And this showed in many of competition. So guys, you know, Take no prisoners. One time we're in Birmingham competing, and I heard this voice that said, Oi, want a word with you? I looked around, and I thought, What's that? Well, yeah, it was Fatima. And she said, Want a word with you, Sanderson? I thought, Oh, God, what have I done now? So I went up to her and I said, Oh, what's happening, Fatima? And she goes, You've been saying things about me. I said, No, I haven't. I said, Yes, you have. So threw our javelins down, put our fists up like this, a bit of lipstick on girls. When you're going for a fight, make sure you look good. Right, put my hands up like that. She put hers up and I thought, sit down, Sanders. And she's going to knock your lights out. <laughs> she was a little bit stronger than me. But you know what? Life has been good. Life has been great between Fatima and me. We talked about the 1984 Commonwealth Games like we had. Let me tell you, that was a big, big moment for us. And we went up to Edinburgh, like you know, our good lady had said. The weather was terrible. Girls, you know that horrible rain that makes your hair go like really rubbish? But you know, who cares? Because you're there competing and you want to kick butt. So who cares? You can always dress up and look great later on. So again, there was the Australian girls, there was the New Zealand girl, there was Fatso and me. <laughs> and we came up, right, to the competition now. And in the first round, bam, the javelin went out. Good throw. Everybody got through the first round, hunky door, it was fantastic. Came up to the fourth round, here comes my girl again, Fatima, up with her javelin, bang, threw it out there. Fantastic throw it was. I thought, damn, Sanderson, she screwed you over now. So after that now, she went out and she did this. Finger up there and... <laughs> it's never over until the fat lady sings. So she went out there and did that. I went up in the fifth round, placed my javelin all nice in a rubber position, came up, hit like hell, went out there, got that competition again, under my belt, the winner. No fear, didn't care. I'd won that competition again, and I loved it. Why not? We'd all worked so hard. We'd all thought about it. This is what it's for. You've got to be able to deliver. When you're called upon to deliver, you've got to be able to do that. After that competition, Fatima went and sat over that side, bless her, and I started walking over like this to go and say, oh, you know what, I'm, never mind, that's the way it goes. She looked at me like this, and I thought, no, let's do it another time. <laughs> you know, so... That's the way we were with our rivalry, the way we go on about things, the way we have to compete. It's good that you know your rivals. It's good then you know that you can call on yourself to deliver when you do need to deliver. Life hasn't been sort of great for me. I wasn't born with a gold spoon. My parents couldn't even afford to send me on the school holidays. My dad was a sheet metal worker. My mum was a hairdresser. I thought she did a good job, taught me everything I knew. So, you know, it was hard. It was hard for me, hard for the time. I left school when I was 15. Didn't say that before, but I, I did. I worked right up to the time till I won the Olympic Games in 1984. And that was really hard work. I played a tea girl. I worked in a leisure center. I worked as a short-hand typist, bless my soul. You know, that's why I could hold my javelin so right. The finger's always itching, itching to go. 
But the thing was, I had to do that. And everything, every job that I took on that gave me the time that I could have time out to fulfill that dream, because that's what it is. You set your goal at the start to fulfill your dream, chase it, go after it. Never take your eye off the ball, because this is what you want. All the psychological warfare that plays in whatever life that you're, whatever part of life that you're doing, take it, absorb it. But when you're ready, make sure that you can deliver. And this is what happens in the 1984 Olympic Games. This was going to be the biggest clash of the titans. I'd been injured in 81. I came back in 83. God forbid I'd ruptured my Glenn's tendon. I really thought that I, that was it. I wasn't going to come back. But I came back from that. So it's more or less with all that, you know, adversity, you know, you had to come back and make sure that Things are feeling right for you. If you feel right in here, then still go for it. So we came to the Games. The Olympic trials, fine. Got through the Olympic trials here. We got to Los Angeles. And it was really a lovely feeling. Because when we're in there, sort of things like that in the Olympics, you run and you try and you find your friends and you try and stop shorts and you try and stop all these lovely things that you try and do. In this village, girls, they had places you could coiffer do your hair, all this lot. First time, it was wonderful. So we actually came up to the day of the competition, and I knew it was going to be tough because Tina Lilak from Finland held the world record at the time. She'd thrown over 74 metres, and Fatima had shown just behind her. And I was ranked fourth on paper with 73 and a bit of change. But it doesn't matter that you know whoever you are, if, whether you're world champions or whatever, when you come there to compete or whatever you're doing, you're all at the start. So we actually came to the day of the final competition and went down to the track, warmed up. Mary Peters, remember Mary Peters? Of course we do, wonderful lady. She was my team management. So I must have known then that, you know, there's a little bit of luck on the cards. Got outside, warmed up, got inside now, sat in, in the area, communal area, where you put your spikes on and everything like that. It was about, you know, about half the size of this room. There was a bench there, uh, you know, sort of three squares away, and Tina Leela sat on that, and Fatima sat here, who sat in the middle. Of course it was me. I went and sat in the middle. My heart was racing like crazy. I thought, what is this? It's going to be like King Kong and Godzilla. You ever seen that show? Ta. I knew it was going to be tough, but I sat in the middle because I thought, this is for me. I've got to really see how I feel. Put our spikes on, got outside, and as soon as you walk through the stadium, because there were 69,500 people in that stadium, and as soon as you got in, everything was clicking. Candles clicking, lights clicking, everybody. You heard the little name shouting, come on, Tessa, come on, Fats, come on, Sharon Gibson, from your British lot. And you really, really did get spurred on. I really, really did get spurred on. Walked down to the end. Everybody had warmed up again to try before we start our throw. And I knew, I just knew that something was going to happen. I didn't know whether I was going to win, but I knew something was going to be happen. And the competition had started. So the girls went and had their couple of throws, and Fatima was thrown before me, thank God. It's always good in javelin throwing if you get your rival thrown before you because you think, oh, did they do a good one or not? So, however, she went and did her throws, and it was good. It was a good throw. But I knew that I myself could have reached it, and Tina could have reached it. I came in on my first round, and I picked up my javelin, wiped off the little dirt that was on the end that we'd all been working with, picked it up. And the last thing I remember was, please, God, let it be right in here, because I have a strong faith. And I fitted my javelin up there and got it. As I started running, it was in a great position. I felt it. The point was there, right up my eye. The delivery was just absolutely superb, just like my coach, Will Pace, has always taught me. Make sure that it's right. Make sure you know all you can do is what you can do. Practice what you did in training. Stay focused, nothing else, which I did. And it went out in the first round, a new Olympic record, 69 metres and 56 centimetres. I thought, yeah, OK, you lot try and beat that now. And they could have done. They could have done because they had thrown much further beforehand. But it went on and on and on until it came to the final round. 
and Tina Lilac got up to throw after me. And I remember she picked her javelin up as well and she got it up there. And when she let that go, she did put everything there for Finland, for her, for the world. And it sailed out at 69.00. I could not believe it. I went, yes, it's mine. Farima have beaten you, Tina have beaten you, Tyson have beaten you, the whole world. It was my dream had come through. It taken me 12 years to do that. I wish then that I'd ran. I couldn't see my coach because he's only this big, Wolf Page. But he was small, but have, there's nothing that he never knew about javelin throwing. It all had come perfect. That was my moment in my athletics career that I dreamed for for so long. All the resilience, all the determination, all the pain that you go through, all the injuries, it had all come together. But I delivered when it needed to. And that is what life is about sometimes, when you have to deliver. You have to make sure you know the right button to press, know your rivals, prepare yourself really well, so when you're ready and called upon, you can deliver. Those games for me was fantastic. But there were still little nicer things that happened as well. After I won, and I had my medal presented around my neck, the gentleman said, you've done yourself proud, you've done your country proud. I went, thank you. Because, you know, you got so emotional. When you're on middle podium, it's so emotional. And then after that, when it finished, I went to the village, got to the village, ran to my room. All the girls, all my friends had gone out. They'd gone out discoing, left me. They'd gone out drinking, doing all whatever, celebrating on my behalf. So, okay, I went to bed, slept with my medal on my chest. It's crazy, but I did, because you just think, oh, maybe somebody will come in and take it or something silly like that. But I slept with it on my chest, and the next morning, the first person that came in my room, Daly Thompson. <laughs> Girls, have you ever been hugged by Daly Thompson? <laughs> If you haven't, and you get a chance to, please do. <laughs> he hugged me like this, and he said, you did it, you old bad. I thought, less of the old bag, but I don't care. <laughs> and he gave me a big hug, and he said, I'm so proud of you. I'm so pleased. And I was so chuffed. And then he said, I've got to go now soon. I went, go away. <laughs> Absolutely no way. But it was fantastic that he came in at that time and wished me well. And you know what? He's still one of my greatest friends. Really is. But athletics... That has been one part of my life. We all go through challenges, and like our dear ladies said before, this year and the last two years, really, pandemic has been a nightmare for everyone. It's been hard. That's why I'm so, so pleased to come here tonight, because I know it's wonderful to see us all here in a light mood, you know, in a lighter mood, for all of you, the recipients who are going to get awards tonight, and for those who will be maybe the next time, it's great that we've all lived through this terrible time. I lost my nephew, God forbid, in that. So I know how the heartache and that for a lot of people might have felt. And even though people come up to me and say, oh, you know, what's it like, Tessa? How can you get over this? What about the psychological factor? You've been locked in for pandemic. How's it felt? What I did, it was hard for me too. I took it all on board and knew that we'd have to stay inside, knew that I couldn't go out and exercise for weeks or for days. So you have to take that on board, draw strength from your family. I was able to do that. It made me realise family is so important and everything. But one thing it did, it gave all of us, the whole world, that we're living through something that we had to really sort of fight, fight to overcome and make sure, you know, that we do the right thing. So tonight, I am so, so happy about being here, although things like that are still going on. Being here, sharing your awards with you, it's going to give me such pleasure to hand out, you know, some of these awards when you come up here to collect them. Because I know what it's like to have achieved, work hard, feel that you've done something good, and I'm delighted that the council can recognise all this, you know, that over the pe what the people have done over the years and all that. Bradford is superb. I love Bradford. Woo! Wilf and I, yes, I do. And I really mean that, because when Wilf and I used to come up here and see Joanne, we used to sit down and chat forever, eat a bit of fish and chips, yes. And it was all lovely. Then I went back to Leeds, Carnegie Train, all this sort of thing. But Yorkshire was my stomping ground. 
and I've, it's, I will always sort of love it. The Yorkshire Post did a massive thing on me when I won the games. So, you know, I'm fam very familiar with up here and I love it. And this is one of the moments that I really wanted to sort of be here. I brought my Olympic gold medal to show you all and also the MBE and the CBE. And to end it all, I'll tell you a little story. When I was filming, one of the times with um, Jeremy Beadle and Rusty Lee, remember that? Game for a laugh. Yeah, not as old as me. You cannot remember that. <laughs> well, we were filming one day, one, one uh, weekend, and all of a sudden I had a phone call. It said, um, and um, one of the guys around me said, oh, Tessa, Tessa, the phone call for you. I thought, a phone call for me? But nobody really knows them up here. I said, yes, yes, there's a phone call from you. So I ran over to the other side. And I picked up the phone and the gentleman said, Oh, Miss Sanderson. I went, yes. He said, oh, oh, Mr. Peter so-and-so here, Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh would like you to come to, did, come to lunch on Valentine's Day on the 14th of February. I went, oh, yeah. And then he said, oh, no, madam, this is not a joke. Would really like you to come to lunch, Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh on Valentine's Day on the 14th. February. Oh, and Jeremy, stop taking the piss. <laughs> I thought this can't be true. <laughs> but anyway, I have to tell you that it was true. And I went to Buckingham Palace and had that lunch. I was the only sportsman sitting around 12 people. A lot of the royal family, the queen was there, the corkies were there, and one with the three legs. It was wonderful. The gentleman came around and he offered me this thing, thing to eat. And I said, what's that? He said, it's salmon mousse, madame. Never had salmon moose in my life. But just to end the story, how wonderful that was. I've had so many lovely things that's happened to me. And getting my honour was sort of like the icing on the cake. But listen, thank you all so much for sharing just a potted history of where I'm coming from. And congratulations to all the recipients tonight. And, you know, may everybody else go very, very far. Chase your goals. Go after it. Don't ever take your eyes off the ball. Take no prisoners. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tessa. Tessa Samson, everybody. What an absolute inspiration. And um, it just proves what determination, hard work and grit and that tenacity can do. Um, and I know Tessa touched on it as well, but actually just what a lovely person and how she does it and those relationships is one of the key things as well. Um, so everyone, please do realise your dreams. Um, hopefully we're recognising this tonight here for all the achievements that you've all made. We are going to pause now uh, for a few moments uh, whilst we have some starters. We're going to get those out, so we're going to have a pause. We're going to co convene back here about 10 past 8, and we will start the awards then. So enjoy your starters, everyone. Thank you.
everybody I hope you're enjoying your starters and um, getting to know one another at the tables we're into that seg segment now which is like drum rolls please 
We are about to start the award ceremony, so this is the part absolutely not to be missed. Um, so please continue to enjoy yourselves, but if you could direct your attention back to the stage, that would be fantastic. And I'm going to welcome Kirsten England and Tess Sanderson to start our award ceremony. Thank you. So, uh, welcome back, everybody. Hope you've had a great time so far. Now, look. We're about to move on to the awards. Before we do that, a couple of housekeeping rules from me. The first is, I know we're having a good time, it's really nice to see people, but when people are receiving their awards, can we have silence just so that we can give due respect to the amazing people who are going to be coming up? It's also quite nerve-wracking, so they need our support um, for that. And then the second thing is, can we make one hell of a noise when people come up to get their awards? And actually, just want to practice this. So, can I, and, and whooping is, you know, absolutely welcomed, yeah? So after I say one, two, three, and Tessa will tell me whether you've done it enough so that we can get started. So we'll just have a quick practice, shall we? Okay, so, you ready? One, two, three. Woo! <laughs> what do you think, what do you think, Tessa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think yeah. they've got it? So the, other, the only other bit I have to say is, can you see if you can keep clapping till they get on the stage? Yeah? Because when the clapping dies before you get here, it's a bit like, oh, oh, all right, then I'll just, you know, get on the stage. So, okay, fantastic. Right, now, um, we've got some amazing um, awards to present and award, and even more amazing award winners. So we're going to start with Apprentice of the Year. So... The Apprentice of the Year Award showcases and celebrates the achievements of our exceptional apprentices. And I, I have met some of them, and let me tell you, they are, they are the future, and they give me real hope uh, for the future of this organisation. Long after I'm mostly looking after my grandchildren and gardening, they will be here carrying the torch for the future of Bradford. Key to this award are the inspirational qualities that the apprentice brings to their team they're in and the council. Now, this award is sponsored by Visma Talent Solutions, and huge thanks to them for that. Unfortunately, they can't be with us, so we can move without further ado to see the nominations. So we're going to keep our eyes on the screen, and let's see who our nominees are. The finalists, the finalists for Apprentice, Apprentice of, the of the Year are, year are as follows. Alex Clark. Alex has taken every opportunity to learn the ropes of what it takes to be a safety advisor. He completes his learning to an excellent standard and in his first year with the council, Alex volunteered to be one of many mental health champions, using his skills and experience to help and support others. Alicia White. Alicia has been a painting and decorating apprentice at Bradford Council for the past three years. She is enthusiastic and helpful and always goes the extra mile. Recently, Alicia was a prize winner at the prestigious Painting and Decorating Association Awards 2021. Laura Richardson. Laura is impressed with her commitment not only to her own personal development, but also to her role. Laura works extremely hard, which resulted in distinctions across the board. These results are testament to her hard work and are very well deserved. Seth Wells. Seth is an able apprentice engineer, eager to utilise his skills. He is able to produce highly technical scheme designs and drawings. At the height of COVID-19, Seth was involved in the design and implementation of the Manchester Road Social Distancing Scheme. So tell us, who is the winner? The winner of the Apprentice of the Year is... Alex Clark! <laughs> Fantastic. So we've done the first award, tried out our clapping legs. That was all right. I think, you know, let's get louder and louder until we get to the, 
Team of the Year award, but well done to Alex. And apologies that I got you to clap halfway through announcing the nominees. So sorry about that. Let's not do that so we can hear who's actually been nominated. I don't always get it right. That's clear. OK, let's move on to the second award, which is for our sustainability stars. And this is a new award recognising employees who are taking positive action towards a sustainable future for the council and the district. So net zero, clean growth, climate change emergency, all of those things. Key to this award is recognising individuals or teams who are doing their bit for the environment and finding new ways in which to help tackle climate change. Fantastic, really important work. OK, so this award is sponsored by the Broadway for whom many thanks for their support. But again, they can't be with us today. So we can have a good look at the nominees. The finalists for Sustainability Stars are as follows. Cathy Grillo. Cathy is the single point of contact for sharing sustainability and climate news with the district. She takes complex information and makes it tangible for the layperson. Communication is central to the sustainable development journey and Cathy brings it to life by recognising that people drive the sustainability agenda and she works proactively with colleagues to tell a story that means something to people. Sally Jones. The Bradford Council Clean Air Plan was commended by the government. The council is the only fourth authority to have plans approved by government, meeting all directed timescales. When asked what could be developed as part of the Clean Air Plan, both the public and businesses express strong support for electric buses and park and ride facilities. And Sally Jones is at the forefront of this to make it happen. Great, isn't it? It is. The winner of the Sustainability Stars is Sally Jones. Yay! Sally. So, moving on now to our third award of the night, which is for Collaboration and Partnership. The Collaboration and Partnership Award showcases and celebrates creative and successful partnerships. Now, key to this award is how the partnership has impacted on and improved service delivery and outcomes for the district and its residents. I'm delighted to say this award is sponsored by YPO, um, thank you to you for your support. And you are here, which is great. I hope you're here anyway. Um, and um, please can I invite a representative of YPO onto the stage to help present the award. <laughs> okay, so shall we see the nominations? The finalists for collaboration and partnership are as follows. The Home Support Reviewing Team. This team looks at packages of care by working with in-house services, the independent sector, commissioning and VCS. The team concentrate on all short-term enablement so people become fully independent, requiring a reduced package of care and keeping them in charge of their own lives. The Waste Collection Service. When COVID hit, the Waste Services supported emergency planning with transporting nurses, doctors and patients throughout the evenings when we were hit with severe snow and ice conditions. They also supported with delivering over 100 hampers across the district to young children so that they had something to open on Christmas Day. The Broadway Food Hub team. This team came together from across the council private and VCS sector to set up two warehouses to deliver 14,000 parcels of food and essentials to vulnerable and shielding people seven days a week. This service provided a lifeline to Bradford residents in need as well as a lasting legacy that developed into the No Child Cold project. Bradford and Airedale Hospital Hubs. Prior to the pandemic, the integrated discharge hub was developed between the two hospitals in the district. 
Once the pandemic hit, the skills of this partnership was utilised and retained to provide a seamless discharge service that put patients at its very centre, showcasing the many community services that work together when planning discharge. The Refugee Integration Service This is a newly formed service for refugees in Bradford who receive leave to remain and only have 30 days before their financial support ends and they need to leave their current accommodation. To manage the volume of people coming through, they set up in the hotel assessing housing and other needs and as a result no one ended sleeping in the interchange. The Reading Recovery Team A group of organisations worked in partnership to deliver an innovative approach to reading recovery following the COVID-19 pandemic for primary age children. Late Up Primary School had over 300 children receiving library cards and exciting ways to discover their local library. So exciting, isn't it? Yes, it is. Ooh. The winner of the of collaboration and partnership is Waste Collection Service. <laughs> Award. I mean, that was amazing work, wasn't it, that we saw from all those teams. So you were all winners. So we're going to move on now to uh, Leader of the Year Award. Um, the Leader of the Year Award showcases and celebrates inspirational leadership. Key to this is how the leader demonstrates leadership attributes and qualities and the impact that has on the people they work with. This award is sponsored by AWM. Delighted that somebody is here tonight to help present the award. If they could please come to the stage. There oh, we go. I thought you were going to leap on the stage there for a minute. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. That's quite right. Good job, Tessa. Yeah. Um, um, right. So let's see the nominees. The finalists for Leader of the Year are as follows. Joanne Gleason. Joanne helped the team to adapt to providing the act of remembrance virtually with the advent of COVID last year. With the death of His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh earlier this year, Joanne led on the civic office response and as a district the death of the Duke was marked tastefully and correctly. Paul Hunt. Actions speak louder than words and Paul always speaks loudly with the positive things he does. During the pandemic, Paul implemented the COVID-19 bulletin, which quickly became a widely used tool, and now there are over 100 editions. Paul created a shout-out, shout-back email system for the team, which is a popular way for the team to share questions and knowledge. Claire Willoughby. Claire always manages to find a good balance between supporting her team and ensuring that work is done to a high standard. The person who nominated Claire said, I met Claire, I had spilt a whole coffee down my white shirt moments before my interview, to which Claire laughed it off and proceeded to interview me. This is the first job that I feel I actually fit in and want to make a career of, and this is all thanks to Claire. Ismail Muller Ismail is described as a dynamic, inspirational and selfless leader. He manages the finance protection team which registers the death and arranges dignified funerals of those that pass away with no next of kin or are unable to pay for funeral expenses. And he does this maintaining the highest of standards. Jenny Cryer. Jenny took over her role during the pandemic, bringing positive energy and structure to the team at a time when it needed it most. Jenny brought the right blend of humanity and strategic purpose creating a more purposeful and cohesive mood during often difficult and exhausting times. Farouk Latif. Since starting fostering, Farouk has been nothing but exemplary. 
It's nice to have a manager who not only supports you, but is there for you. Farouk will always provide clear guidance and is always focused on getting the best for children and carers in the service. Farouk always listens to the voice in team meetings and always takes any positive and concerns forward. The winner of the Leader of the Year Award is Ishmael Muller. Okay, last award before you get to your main course. So, children at the heart of all we do. Couldn't be any more important than this, the youngest city in our country. So, for this award, entries from across the council demonstrate best practice in the delivery of fantastic services for children and young people. Placing children at the heart of everything we do, evidence from engagement, insight, the approaches taken and the positive impact on children and young people. Delighted to say this award is sponsored by Impar and we have someone from Impar with us. So if they could make their way to the stage, that would be great. Hello. <laughs> okay, shall we see our nominees? The finalists for children at the heart of all we do are as follows. Ashley Randall. Ashley is a highly innovative and imaginative social worker that ensures children she works with remain central to all that she does. Ashley is insightful and sensitive in understanding the child's world and will work hard to build trust and familiarity with all the children she works with, a truly caring and nurturing social worker who brings out the best for children consistently. Helen Borg. Furthering Talent is a programme designed to help 30 musical young people from low-income families from the moment the first sparks of potential appear. The pupils engage in music workshops and interact with other young musicians like themselves, and as a result they are confident, happy children doing better at school in subjects other than music. Joy Robson. Joy is an asset to the Care Leavers team. From the moment she hears a young person is interested in going back into education, she will support and not give up until they are back in the classroom. It's not only learning about maths and English, but ensuring young people are up, had breakfast, know when their exams are, and have someone to call when they finish that exam. And that person is Joy. Nikki Lennon. Nikki is an exceptional youth worker and manages and runs a youth centre that provides safe, accessible space for all children, young people and families. Nikki secured funding to purchase mountain bikes so young people have opportunities to learn new skills and through his work a number of young people have become volunteers in the district and even gone on to work for the council. Jump Project Leads. 12 young people aged 16 to 25 are at the heart of leading this unique 12 month leadership programme that will see community role models leading sessions in physical activity, health and wellbeing for younger children and peers. The project aims to increase visibility and role models for young people, many who are currently underrepresented both in the sports and health industry. Transport Services The Transport Service is responsible for transporting around 1,500 of the district's most vulnerable children to and from school, many of whom have profound special educational needs and or physical disabilities. They also transport clients from adult social care and looked after children. When COVID hit, this team was redeployed where they delivered over 14,000 food parcels to the community and 3,000 laptops to school, the highest in the UK. Thanks, Sarah. And the winner of Children at the Heart of All We Do is the Jump Leads Project. <laughs>
I promise Tess had nothing to do with deciding those they were the award winners, but I guess that was pretty close to your heart, really, wasn't oh, it? I, I'm so delighted at seeing that award. Yeah, seeing... With young children. That's yeah. Really fantastic. Seeing young people yeah. getting involved in physical activity. Hurrah, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Hurrah for that. So, wow. and, and I know you want to shuffle us off the stage. Shall I just do it, seeing as I'm here? So... so <laughs> Shall I go and it? sit? No, no. You stay with me. You stay, <laughs> we're staying together. Anyway... <laughs> So that's the end of the first five awards. We're going to have our main course. I think you'd agree. It, the things people do are pretty awesome around here. Everything I said at the beginning of my speech, I stand by and you've seen it illustrated by our first set of award winners and all those nominated, can I just say. I hope you feel very proud. Let's have our main course and we'll be back for the next set of awards in how long? 45 minutes. Oh, that's good. Got that's enough time. time. You didn't get a chance to finish your starters, did you? So you can, yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. Enjoy your main course and we'll see you soon. Bye.
a huge thank you to our fantastic dancers. Thank you so much. Right, everybody, are you ready for some more awards? Sorry, I couldn't quite hear that. You ready for some more? Yeah, that's more like it. Okay, well, I'd like to welcome Tessa and Kirsten back to the stage and we will crack on with some more awards. Okay, so we're back in the award zone. Now, what do I need to remind you? Whooping, cheering, yep. Let's only get louder towards the end of the evening. Uh, but without further ado, um, let's move on to the Innovation Award. So, the Innovation Award showcases and celebrates innovation within our workforce. Key to this award is the new idea in finding a solution and bringing value and benefit for the council and district. This award is sponsored by HCL Technologies UK Limited. Thank you for their support. I know we've got somebody here with us. If they can make their way to the stage, that would be great. It's looking. Oh, there you are. Don't worry, don't run. You know what will happen if you run. <laughs> Not in the heels, no. Okay, so can we see the nominations, please? The finalists for the Innovation Award are as follows. Ben Oxlade Parker. Ben solely came up with and implemented the idea of using electronic traffic signs across the district to relay messages, particularly around vaccinations. The pathway he suggested supported over 735 unpaid carers received their vaccine. Over 400 confirmed they had called the team as a direct result of seeing the boards around Bradford. Chris Copley. Chris is passionate in supporting users with disabilities and impairment that require technology that needs adaptation. He creates e-learning packages with videos that have automatically generated captions for users with hearing impairment or plain text versions of e-learning content for visually impaired colleagues. Russ Tully. Russ is always thinking of innovative ways to engage parents and young people in the work his team does. During lockdown, the team were unable to go into homes, so Russ spearheaded the creation of animated videos which supported parents with information on how to manage behaviour in a fun and easy way. Uploading them to a new YouTube channel has proved popular for training now. Stronger Communities Team The Bradford for Everyone Stronger Communities Team set up Bradford for Everyone Ambassadors as well as the Shared Value Campaign, which is the first of its kind in Europe. The team also created the Citizen Coin app, which connects potential volunteers to meaningful activities for which they receive digital coins to be redeemed in local businesses. And the winner of the Innovation Award is Ben Oxalade Parker. <laughs> Our next award, a really important award, it goes to the heart of what we're about here in Bradford District. It's the award for building diversity and inclusion in this big, beautiful, complex, diverse place. This work is incredibly important. So key to this award is how the activity addressed the authorities' equalities objectives and helped to build the more inclusive environment we all aspire to create. The award is sponsored by Commensura. Can we please invite a representative on stage to present the award with Tessa? Hello. So, shall we see our nominees? 
The finalists for Building Diversity and Inclusion are as follows. Jodie Leach. Jodie has played a key role in the design and development of the Respect campaign, the purpose of which is to bring together an overarching campaign that is relatable to all staff and ultimately provides a platform from an allyship programme. Jodie displays the Bradford behaviours and is also the co-chair of the LGBTQ plus staff network. Jodie has been nominated four times in this category, a fantastic achievement in itself. Michelle Taylor. Michelle is the lead for Women's Voice Staff Network. She's active in making workplaces more gender equal and goes above and beyond to see this happen. Michelle delivers the training on menopause to managers as well as colleagues. She also runs the Menopause Cafe so women have a safe space to talk. LGBTQ plus staff network leads. Jodie Leach and Paul Hunt are co-chairs of this network and are committed to ensuring workplace diversity and inclusion. Their duties include being a spokesperson for the network and advising and giving feedback on a range of equality issues. They were both heavily involved in the Stonewall Workplace Equality Index. The Stronger Communities Team the Bradford for Everyone Stronger Communities team are leading the way in building more connected, kinder and resilient communities. They have funded over 70 community-based projects to test and learn new ideas, such as intergenerational linking between care homes and primary schools, to reduce isolation in the elderly and break down intergenerational and ethnic boundaries that exist. And the winner of the Building Diversity and Inclusion is Jodie Leach. Congratulations. Was that me? Feedback? Congratulations, Jodie. Uh, I mean, all of them would have been worthy winners, but nobody can fail to have been moved by the speech you made at the beginning of Inclusion Week when we launched the Respect campaign that was your inspiration. So I'm absolutely delighted you are the recipient of that award. So. Okay, well, we're moving on to the two biggie biggies. So, Employee of the Year and Team of the Year. Can't believe it's gone so fast, really. But anyway, okay, so Employee of the Year. So, this award recognises the incredible, excellent work and dedication of an employee of the council. And key to this is how that employee demonstrates innovative thinking and makes a real and significant difference in the delivery of council services. Delighted that Wooler. Um, our partners in delivering uh, Bradford Live and the Odeon project are with us and are the sponsors of the award. If there's someone who can join us on stage, that would be great. <laughs> and a local company to boot. Fantastic. So let us see the nominees for Employee of the Year. The finalists for Employee of the Year are as follows. Michael Horsley. Michael has shown great innovation by applying the principles of infection control to help ensure all our workforce can work as safely as possible. His calm mindset and expert knowledge has been appreciated by those who sought his support and advice, and he has been described as an inspiration to work with. Philip Cockburn. Philip has taken it upon himself to coach newly appointed wardens and help them learn the ropes. He works closely with the enforcement team and organises patrols in areas where there are problems with littering or dog fouling. He manages to find resources and gets the job done, even if he has to step in himself. Rod Robertson. Rod is a very dedicated and experienced neighbourhood warden who organised two days of coordinated action that removed 27 tonnes of waste. He collects surplus food from supermarkets at the weekend and evenings and in his own time for the food share table as well as leading the Christmas Wrap Initiative, where children can select and wrap a present for their parents and siblings. Pauline Smith. 
At the start of the pandemic, neighbourhood wardens were asked to support a network for vulnerable and elderly people. Pauline is generous and passionate. An example is that she befriended a 97-year-old. She does the weekly shopping for her, as well as visiting a gentleman with Alzheimer's in her own time, and she continues to visit him even after he moved into a care home. Robert Dunn. Robert excels in customer service and is pragmatic in finding solutions. He has a positive impact on employee morale and engagement and embodies the Bradford values and behaviours. Robert has helped save the service thousands of pounds in lost time and resource due to resolving IT issues quickly. Dale Keaton. Dale took on the responsibility to check over buildings whilst they were closed during the pandemic. He spent time wrapping many of the objects on open display to keep them safe. He created engaging Instagram posts on his page, The Quiet Museum, something that was an amazing hit and got people from all over the world engaged in Bradford's museum service. You're waiting for this, aren't you? <laughs> the winner of the Employee of the Year is... Pauline Smith! <laughs> Well done, Pauline, from all of us. And, whoa, how many finalists from the warden service? Are very impressive. They're worth the weight in gold, aren't they, our, our wardens? But so were all those finalists. And I know some of the difference uh, that they've made over the last year. So, people, we're moving to Team of the Year Award. Incredibly difficult category because there's so many fantastic teams across the council. So this final award it recognises a team for the outstanding work they've achieved together displaying all the great attributes of a good team. Effective team working. A key to this is showing true team spirit, ability to deliver excellence, adaptability, ability to adapt and flex to changing circumstances, um, and delivering for the people of the district. This is award is sponsored by Muse, and uh, unfortunately they can't be here with us, but it does mean we can move straight to nominations and hear about the fantastic teams that have been nominated this year. So, play the tape. The finalists for Team of the Year are as follows. Bingley Youth Work Team. Bingley Youth Cafe offers education and learning opportunities to some of the most vulnerable and at-risk young people. When COVID meant it closed, the support was given through street-based youth work. The young people said that if it wasn't for their youth worker, they know they would have harmed themselves or done stupid things, that the youth workers kept them safe and were always there for them. Revenues, benefits and payroll. To date, 11 different business grant schemes have been induced due to the pandemic, and in total, this service has paid out more than £222 million to around 17,000 businesses. The payroll service has paid over 500 additional staff recruited specifically for COVID-related activities. Despite many challenges, these team members have worked long hours to get the job done. Emergency planning and licensing. These two teams came together to act as one. They set up the COVID testing site. They project managed working with hospital trusts for patient transfer to homes when the ambulance service was struggling with resources. During the flooding this year, the team were out late into the night ensuring that vulnerable citizens were warned. They are called out in the middle of the night as the council's first responders and often the first contact for the council for residents in difficult circumstances. The Covid Hub. This was formed to coordinate the council's response to the pandemic. 
and there was a need for a seven day a week approach. The COVID hub has shown the very best of what local government can do and enhanced the reputation of our organisation with partners and citizens. The individual stories have shown that over the last 12 months, they have literally helped save people's lives. Waste care services. A large scale fire started at Spring Mill Street in the early hours of 16th November, where a major incident was then declared by the fire service. This team worked 12 hour shifts, 24 hours a day, taking the HGV vehicles into the fire to turn over the tires. The fire service confirmed that had this support not been provided, this fire would have been active and continued to burn for over a month instead of 10 days. Residential and daycare services. Without the staff's resounding response and drive, even though they feared with the backdrop of COVID and possible impact on their loved ones and families, they continued to turn up for work delivering good quality services to people who needed it. This TAF team has been selfless, ensuring that services continued. Now then, do you know we've got two? Two? We've got two. So hard, so hard. We actually have two teams of the year. So and rightly so. What I'm a right wonderful right. job that everybody's doing. Incredible. I can't believe it. Incredible. I'm so proud of you. It's amazing. So, right, it's the, the winner of the team. The first one, the first winner. Yep. Oh, oh, the first team. Because we might have right. to separately. So let's do rah rah for them and then we'll Right, rah -rah okay. Them. As my good lady says. <laughs> <laughs> do rah rah for them. Right. The first team. See, the Cove. Right. <laughs> the Covid Hub team. <laughs> And now, the winner of the year of the COVID hub oh, yeah. is, oh, we've done that one. <laughs> Team of the year. That was their fault, not mine. Yeah, it was. Right. <laughs> We're ready for it. Can you see my lips? <laughs> Waste care services. <laughs> So, much. so colleagues I can't believe it it's gone too fast I wish I could do it all over again um, and I wish we could bottle what's happened here this evening and share it with all our colleagues because it would give everybody a huge boost can I ask you to give yourselves every single one of you in the room a huge round of applause because you are all awesome <laughs> We're almost done. I'm, I am going to hand across to the leader of the council just to close out the formal proceedings. But can I just say a couple of thank yous? Um, I do want to say a huge thank you to the people behind the scenes here tonight who've made it just a, the most memorable evening. And everything has worked so well. 
you know, but for the glitches of your presenter here who lost her shoes and fluffed a few lines, everybody else has been fantastic. I particularly want to thank Tamima and team and Wasim and all this. It was Tamima's voice you heard through all of the descriptions of the nominees, so beautifully articulated. I know she was up to the middle of the night doing it, but there's a whole posse involved, including the Bradford Hotel. Thank you very much for your hospitality. You've been amazing. And of course, tonight wouldn't have been tonight without the incredible Tessa Sanderson. I think we've grown to know. <laughs> yeah, you're. You are now officially inducted as part of Team Bradford. Your Bradford fan base is secure. You've helped us all get really focused on what we're going to achieve. We're going to take no prisoners, and the tip of our javelins are going to be just so, and we're going to feel it I'm from ready. there. You're ready. <laughs> and, uh, well, absolutely. Um, we've taken you to our hearts, and you've been amazing. And, you know, um, not to mention all the awards, inspirational speaking, what you also don't know about Tessa is that she also adopted two uh, twins nine years ago um, and is the proud mother of two adopted children. So she's doing, you know, loves work. She's doing the work we all really care about for children as well. So, all right, an amazing person. So, not at all, not at all. So... Our final and very important speech of the night is to hear from our council leader, Councillor Susan Hinchcliffe. So welcome to the stage and Tess and I will depart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Well, thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. And wow, what a night. It has been wonderful. I love these awards because you get a chance just to look and hear all the brilliant work that's happening across the district, across this council. And people in this district should know exactly what you do and how what great value you provide to the Bradford public. So thank you. I mean, I'm here tonight with members of the executive to say thank you to you on behalf of all councillors. We've been so thankful to you, particularly over the last couple of years. Your dedication to public service has been tested to the max, uh, and uh, you've come out shining, I have to say, through that. Now, we're a big, bold district and city, and like any big place, we have our challenges, but we also have our opportunities, and I'm determined that we realise these. I believe in Bradford, and as Kirsten says, we have huge plans for this place, but we can't deliver them without you. And wherever you work in the organisation, you have a big, important part to play in delivering those plans, whether that's finance, legal, uh, street cleansing, uh, skills, transport, social care, all of those have a huge role to play in making us a brilliant place to live. And I'm so proud to be leader of this council and of this place. You make us proud. And when I hear about the work of refuse collectors who keep going when other local authorities are struggling, uh, when I hear about youth service getting into really challenging conversations with our young people, you make us proud. And when I hear about our best team being praised by others across the country, you make us proud. And all of you, I have to say, make us proud every day. Um, thank you for being brilliant and keep on being Bradford. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hinchcliffe. Well, I just want to say a few more thank yous. Thank you to every single person in this room. Um, thank you very much to our sponsors because you form an important part in making us, you know, making this happen and making it so, so incredible for people. So thank you. Thank you to the staff at the Bradford Hotel. You have been brilliant. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you to you. Also, thank you to our dancers. Um, I have got one last request from, from my team, and I know how to be a very good team manager because I basically do as I'm asked, um, and that seems to keep everybody happy. So um, my team said, um, and, and again, thank you to my team. You've been fantastic in pulling this off, and I know you've worked incredible hours for this, and you are just tremendous, so thank you for that. <laughs> So 
So we have some more food for you, some dessert that we'll be doing rounds in a, in a moment. We also have a band, um, they will take requests. So we're going to finish the evening with some food and some music. There is a selfie stand I think most people are acquainted with, so please enjoy that. Enjoy yourselves for the rest of the evening. Um, we want um, everybody who's won tonight to come to the front because we would like to take a picture of you all together. Um, so if everybody can make their way up to the front, uh, whilst you're doing that, I will just say thank you again. I hope you've enjoyed the evening. Um, have a fantastic rest of night. You are incredible, you are talented, and you make Bradford special. Thank you. Thank you.